just tell us a little bit of what the game is and how it came into being. I should probably start by saying that I used to be a journalist for 10 years before I, we decided to, to create the Pixel Hunt. And I think that's definitely been the main source of the fuel and influence for me and my work. Uh, we want to make reality-inspired games, and that's the reason for the, the creation of my company, basically. So we were looking uh, for the topic for our first uh, independent video games. We've been working for clients, but we wanted to work on our first independent project. And we had a couple uh, topics in mind. And obviously, the topic of forced migration was uh, all over the news back in 19, uh, 2015. Uh, so I thought it would be interesting to make a game about this topic, but I really could not come, come up with an idea of how to do that, because games are fairly special media, and they are often associated with mindless fun and being for teenage, teenagers, for instance. And so I, I really wanted to find a way to make a game that would be aimed at uh, an adult audience and that would be able to tackle this topic with uh, the respect the topic deserve. So it was, it, was, it was tough, but then we bumped into an article on French newspaper Le Monde that was called The Journey of a Syrian Migrant as Told Through Her WhatsApp Conversations. And it was basically a translation and four of 400 uh, screen screenshots of a conversation between a girl named Dana and her family. Well, the family was staying in Syria and Dana was trying to reach Europe. And so this article was really a really intense reading for me. And when I read it, I immediately thought it would be very interesting to have this as an interactive form. Uh, as a game for people to realize what this journey between Syria and Europe really is about. So that's basically like reading this article in French newspaper Le Monde is basically what gave us the initial idea as as to what game we could we could make about this topic. And there was something you said to me when when we were speaking about this before. You said that. Uh, you had realized you'd fallen into the trap of thinking of, or the, the mindset of thinking of the refugees having this experience as something that was very hard to relate to and very different yeah. from you. And then you read the WhatsApp messages and you're like, well, that's like WhatsApp messages me and my friends send, apart from the bits about crossing seas and fleeing bombs, but the, the voice is so relatable that that gave you yes. the feeling that this could be a, a successful game? Yeah, it was definitely the case. Like, reading this article was not a very pleasant experience for me, and not, not just because it was about a very tough topic, but also because I realized that, unbeknownst to me, I had uh, built um, a vision of what a migrant is nowadays that had nothing to do with the truth, basically. Because, like, I have, I have seen a lot of coverage by mainstream media discussing the questions in terms of numbers, for instance. How many of them should France welcome? Or how many of them should uh, the UK or Poland or any other country from the EU uh, welcome? And uh, I also had seen all those images on TV of packs of people that you, can, you can't even see their faces and you just see the mass, the crowd of people packed uh, at the borders of Europe. And those are very scary images. So even though I didn't want that, my, my imagination uh, was uh, like twisted by this media coverage. And I, and I had come to, to imagine that migrants were very different from who I was. But reading this article, I just realized what should have been obvious for me is that it's not the case. When you're 24 years old and you, when you live in Syria and you want to reach Europe, you have the dreams in your head, you have a family that loves you and that cares about you, and you, you have way more in common with me than the differences between, between you and me. There are differences and we must acknowledge them, but 
you are a human being, I am a human being, and that's something I almost forgot because of the mainstream media coverage. And I thought to myself, if I have been falling in that trap, then probably a lot of other people are falling in that trap too. The trap of stripping migrants of, of their humanity and the fact that they are human beings with people who love and care about them. So maybe if we have, if we make a game that stresses that like this humanity is shared by us all over the, the, the global, but no matter our personal situation, maybe it's something that is going to be useful for, for the people who play the game. And I think and I hope that we achieve that to, to convey a very humane story through, through the game that we made. For people here who are not familiar with the game's world, not just on this particular game, but what this involves, you know, like, I'm going to make a game, what's this process? I mean, I can see you're not sitting in a, like a, a huge uh, skyscraper in Paris. No, um, I know. <laughs> how are you, how are you, tell us a little bit about also how you're making this happen, as well as the specific research and process for this game. Well, the first, the first thing is that we, like, from the get-go, I thought to myself, we can't make a game about that topic without having someone directly involved in this situation, being involved in the process of making the game. So I got in touch with a journalist from Le Monde, Lucie Soulier, and I told her about my idea to basically make an adaptation of this article into a video game. And her first reaction, as she's someone who never played video game before, she probably thought I was a little bit crazy, uh, of having the idea of making a game with all the, the ideas of like games not being a serious form of, of art slash media. So she, the, her first reaction was to tell me that she, she didn't want to participate in that. And I, and I explained to her what we really wanted to make and how we considered game to be powerful media. And then she said, okay, listen, it's not, it's not my decision to make. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk with Dana about this, ideas of yours. And she's the one who is going to decide whether she wants to help you or not. And if she's okay with it, then I will be okay with it too. And so she, 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 she contacted Dana and she told about uh, this idea. Just a, and, Dana uh, was the woman whose story had been featured in the article, is that right? Yes. The message, yes. yes. Yes, that, that's true. And it's it's funny because Dana, she like she 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 was she was okay with helping us from the very beginning. So the the person who actually had lived through the situation was way more easy to convince to convince to make a game about her life story than the person who was only the reporter of the story. And I think it's interesting because what Dana told me from the get go is. We've been through so much, and it's been so complicated and so hard that I made a promise to myself that I would help anyone who would want to try to explain what the situation actually is. And if you want to do that, I will definitely do everything in my powers to help you. And so that's, that's how the project started, because once I knew that Dana was okay to help us, and that she would be okay to share a whole experience with us, and also that she would be okay to read all the game script in order to just check that we were uh, telling the story right. Then I knew that we, we would probably be able to make something that would be close to the reality and close to the situation that, that she experienced. Even though I insist that Burry My Love is a fiction and our main, main character, who is called Noor in the game, is not Dana. It's not a biographical game. It's a fiction. But we, we try to build the fiction as realistically as possible. And Dana's involvement and Dana's like uh, validation of what we wrote is definitely one of the reasons why I think the game like. And so once we had Dana on board, we gathered lots of information from lots of different sources for four months before we even started writing the game script. It was only documentation for three to four months. 
And then we wrote the game script and the branching because there's like lots of different possibilities in the game. And once we were writing, every time we had a specific question, we would like take our phones and contact Dana uh, via WhatsApp and ask all the questions we would need for in order for us to be like as close to the reality as possible. And then when once we finished writing the script, she read through the entire script, which was 110,000 words long. So it's it's pretty huge. And and then basically the game was done. What's the commercial model for this floor in terms of you running this studio? Yeah, um, it's terrible. <laughs> how do you even vaguely make it work? Basically, we funded the game before we we even got it out. Thanks to a public grant by the French Center for uh, Cinematography that uh, occasionally helps video games. Uh, we had a co-production deal with Arte, the French-German TV channel, and we had a private investment from my company because, as I mentioned before, we have, we have worked for clients for three years before we started working on Very My Love, and all the money that we saved for those clients' jobs we reinvested it in the game, basically. And uh, so the game is, is a paid game. You, you, you have to pay like four euros, basically, to get the game. Uh, because we didn't want to make it uh, a free game because we thought it would be important for people to realize that there is, there's been a, basically a lot of work and there's value in, in the game. And very often, mobile game games that are free are full of uh, ads and stuff like that, and they are not, not considered very like, high in terms of quality. So sadly, uh, well, it's not, it's not really sad, actually, because that's, that's how we planned it. But we didn't like, recoup all the investment we put into the game. But that, that's kind of the main reason why I created the, the Pixel Hunt, is like working for clients, getting money to invest on risky uh, independent projects and then make those um, independent projects exactly the way we want them to be. So that's kind of the cost for being able to make the game we wanted to make. So now we are in the process of afraid to funding the next game and it's probably going to be exactly the same business model for as long as we can afford uh, to, to keep going, basically. And tell us a little bit about the reception to the game and the kind of comments and feedback you've had. Yeah, so ba basically the, the overall reception was really positive. We had a lot of very good uh, player feedback, uh, press feedback. We we got some 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 award, uh, awards nominations nominations and we won some awards. But as you as you might expect. There's also be, been some, some negative criticism. And some of it like, was from the far right, basically, uh, because uh, we were like, making uh, propaganda and being like, you know, what, what the usual far right rhetoric is. It's not very interesting. And but we, what was more surprising is also that we had criticism from people who were actually involved in in association that would help migrants in France, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, because they would they would accuse us of dehumanizing uh, the migrants' fate and also of uh, profiting of 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 harsh realities, which is factu factually not true. But uh, the point is, um, I can understand that. If you're not familiar with the idea that games can be something else than just entertainment and explosions and guns and or soccer matches, I can understand that you can be troubled by the, the idea of making a game about such a topic. But I think it's the same thing that comic books had to face in the 70s when Art Spiegelman, for instance, said he wanted to make a, a a comic book about his, his family's uh, story in the Nazi Germany concentration camps. Probably when he said that in the 70s, lots of people 
must have thought he was out of his mind because how can you make a comic book about uh, the Shoah, basically? And then he, he made it anyway, and he made Mouse. And Mouse, nowadays, is considered one of the comic book uh, masterpieces uh, of all time. So I hope that video games are going to go down a similar path and be more and more used for uh, opening up discussions about the world we live in, basically. And we are not obviously not as talented, not as talented as Art Spiegelman is, but I hope that Bernie Malov is part of this trend of using video games as a mature medium to discuss the world around us, basically. So, obviously, my name is Corey. I am one of the co-creators of the game called Windrush Tales, which is about leaving the Caribbean and basically coming into 1950s Britain to start a new life. Um, it's a game which kind of talks and explores subjects which, as Florence has kind of said, topics that don't get to be explored too much in video games, such as race and immigration, um, generally kind of through the lens of what it's like to be coming to the country as a West Indian immigrant, but also someone from potentially from the Commonwealth. Um, before I get too far into that, just a quick introduction about myself. So, I have been working in the video games industry for about 18 years now. Um, I first started off as a uh, video games journalist. I was one of the first black British video game journalists in the country. Still don't know who the very first one is. Can't seem to find them, but, uh, but they are out there. And um, from then, I basically worked as a journalist for a, a few years. I went to Yahoo after that point. I was working as a game producer for about a year. Then I left Yahoo and became a freelance writer for a couple of years, doing work for games uh, companies such as Vivendi and EA, um, also doing some work for other games uh, publications like Eurogamer and uh, Game Central and Metro. After that, I actually joined uh, PlayStation, for where I was there for about oh, 12 years, literally up until May when I left the company and decided to go freelance again. So basically, after during that entire period of time, I also started writing comic books as well and doing other bits and pieces in the various industries of entertainment, both music and comic books, and maybe a little bit of TV as well. Um, what is this to say is that I have seen the games industry and various other entertainment industries from various prisms. Uh, I started off as a consumer, I went into journalism, I then went into third party uh, publishing and then I went into first party pub publishing and now I'm an uh, independent creator. So I've seen the games industry grow and it's still got some fair ways to go in terms of diversity representation, but it has changed for the better on a whole over the last 18 years or so. So I don't know if you, if you recognize some of these flags here. Um, Basically, as a games industry, it's, uh, it's not a stranger to representation, um, especially giving voice to migrants and children and immigrants. Now, I am actually half Bayesian, which is the flag on the left from Barbados, and half St. which is the flag of St. Kitts and St. Nevis on the right. Um, so I am actually, obviously, a son of an immigrant. I'm also married to an immigrant as well. Um, but what we're seeing is this slow change of video games, films, TV, trying to delve into these topics a little bit more. Um, unfortunately, the main reason you're seeing that is because it's profitable to do so. Um, that is to say that smaller and independent creators have generally been telling these stories for a very, very long time. But it's only when you get the larger multinational companies kind of stepping in that you tend to get the mainstream paying large amount of attention to it. Um, that is generally, unfortunately, the way that things go, especially in a capitalistic society, um, because you have the massive irony of being said that if you want to tell these sorts of stories earlier on, then you need to play in your own pool. Then when it becomes profitable for that pool to be something more for the mainstream, you then have these massive companies like, like Disney and so on saying, oh, we've got the this voice, this fresh new voice, this all this stuff that's on the, the buzz of the zeitgeist, 
why don't you come over to our side of things and watch our entertainment mediums? And sometimes that has the intention of revising history, revising those trailblazers that have actually put those stuff out there in the first place. There's no real way around it. Unfortunately, like I said, as a capitalist society, that's just the way things are. But things are changing. And as things become more in the mainstream society, you tend to see a little bit more awareness and more voices coming out of that. So the internet has also helped change quite a few things. Um, also giving a mic microphone basically to a lot of the voices out there that may not have been heard as loudly in the past. Um, in games, both the combination of both the internet and mobile devices have helped create less overheads for when we actually create video games and also means better distribu distribution. So now anyone across the world can basically play your game within minutes of you publishing it. Um, a few examples up here. You'll see Ink up there, which is actually the publishing uh, and tools that we're using to create um, Tales, Windrush Tales, and uh, Game Maker Studio, which is also used for a lot of different types of games. Now, marketing and standing out from the crowd when you're making these games are still a massive problem. Naturally, the market as it stands is huge, and it's flooded with competing forces. So trying to get your voice heard from everybody else's isn't really that easy. But there are a lot of open source tools out there which make that journey a little bit less strenuous than it would have been. And when you have distribution platforms like Steam in the bottom left there and the Epic Store on the bottom right, um, you can actually get your games out to PC, kind of mobile devices and uh, basically iDevices as well in a very quick and relatively cost efficient way. So going back to Windrush Tales, now we're exceptionally proud to say that we are the very first video game based on Windrush. Um, that's across the 50 plus years of the video game's history. Um, we've also had a historian say to us not too long ago that from her perspective Windrush Tales is one of the most important video games being made in modern times, which is somewhat stressful and uh, <laughs> puts a lot of pressure on us. Um, we know this game is going to mean a lot to a lot of people, especially being the son of um, parents that came over during, during that period of time. We're not going to be everything to everyone. That is impossible. But we hope that we'll do the subject matter some sort of justice and allow people to be able to reflect on the trials and tribulations from that generation itself. Um, Windrush Tales came about from a friend of mine who is a journalist who's now gone to work for a video game company called Ubisoft, um, called Shella Ramanan. She approached me last year and asked if I was interested in becoming a co-creator for this game to celebrate the, what was then the, the 70th anniversary of Windrush, um, because we really wanted to, having both had backgrounds in that, we really wanted to be able to talk about that sort of thing. Um, this was before the whole government scandal with uh, the Windrush papers which obviously was a big deal, um, uh, but I'm not gonna go too much into that because if I do, I will not stop and I will rant and rave for a long time. So in case you're not very familiar with Windrush in itself, so during 1948, uh, there was a massive period of migration from both the Commonwealth and the Caribbean itself. And that changed the entire face of Britain. Um, it gave new homes to a lot of people. Um, including the parents and the grandparents of uh, some of the Windrush Tales team. So we wanted to tell a story which wasn't just about what it was like to be an immigrant during this really kind of turbulent time, but also um, what it was like to be part of the Windrush generation. Both things which are, sadly to say, are uh, extremely relevant in today's society for very obvious reasons. Um, now, the Windrush Tales team is only a team of four people myself included. Uh, we work on this in, uh, obviously, any funds that we get that go towards this are going to be fairly limited. Um, but when I talk about Windrush Tales being a video game, it may not look exactly what you probably would imagine. Now, how many people here are actually gamers or consider themselves gamers? Wow, okay. <laughs> Very few. Okay, so when I say a video game, you're probably thinking of something potentially like this, <laughs> which is obviously Mario from the Nintendo games. Um, Windrush Tales doesn't look anything like this sort of thing. Um, when I'm talking about Windrush Tales, it looks more like this. 
that's the bare bones of Windrush. This isn't what it's going to look like when it's finished. But it's more like a novel. It's all based around prose, um, which is obviously a far cry from the millions and millions of pounds that get spent for a game like a Mario game. Um, so when we actually finish the game with our artist Naima Ramanan, it will look a little bit like uh, this, which will be illustrated, it will be animated, it will have a bit more colour to it, a bit more vibrancy, something that's a little bit more attractive to people who may not necessarily go into the video game's medium. But ultimately, when we were creating this game, we decided to use prose not only because it was useful for us in terms of development, but also because older video games before that really didn't have the technology to be able to do these high-tech visual graphics that you see these days in games. Um, and it's still a valid way to tell video games, as we saw with Bury Me, My Love. Um, but ultimately, for people of my age, I'm getting close to 41 now, um, people of my age who grew up on video games in the medium itself, we had games which looked a bit more like text-based games. Um, but also the subject matter is kind of very relevant to people who may not necessarily want complicated control schemes or interfaces. So having something which is prose-based is a little bit more friendly, a bit, a bit more inclusive for anyone that doesn't want to deal with that sort of thing. Um, especially for younger readers as well, where hopefully it'll be helpful as a literacy aid. But ultimately it is a game, so what we use is choice to help portray the game. And if we don't have fancy graphics, then choice has to be really important to actually creating this game in itself. So, like any other prose-based game, um, the choice is branching narrative. So what that means is that you progress through the game and then ultimately you come to a point where you have to make a choice. When you make that choice, the game then branches off into that path that you've considered, considered and then the other paths are closed off to you. So I'll give a quick uh, demonstration. So, for example, in this particular part, hopefully all will actually move, yeah. So there's not enough time to read through this entire paragraph. You'll be able to see a lot of it for yourself. Um, but in the game, in one particular strand of the game, you play a young artist called Adwin. Now, in this particular example, he has just kind of approached the Cliffs of Dover on the actual Empire Windrush ship and everyone's excited and everyone's talking about it. it's a massive buzz. And another guy called Sam comes up to him and sees that Adwin is sitting alone and decides he wants to talk to him. Now, your particular choice in this game here, you can basically decide to brush him off and continue being alone. You can decide to talk to him and get to know his story a little bit more. Or you can try to correct him in one particular aspect. He's talking about something which is on the ship, which uh, you can have the knowledge to correct him on that. So when you do that, you basically can start a friendship or just continue going about your way. Let's see. So in this particular aspect of it, if it's going to work, yes, there we go. You can decide to maybe just decide to lie and deflect which opens up another strand of the game, which basically tells Sam to go away and to leave you alone. Um, at that point, you don't know anything more about Sam until later on in the game, and that branch is entirely closed off to you. Um, so ultimately, what that is, is allowing you to get an individual style of what your story is going to progress as you go through the game. You'll get different endings. So some of these choices will be small, and some of these choices will be large. Um, but each one is designed individually, so it should give you a nice taste as to what it's like to be going through that particular part of the game. But with some games, you'll have choices which are very binary. They're very right or wrong. For example, if your game is rescuing a hostage from a tower against a big dragon and you have a choice to fight the dragon or run away, the right choice is obviously to fight the dragon. We're dealing with topics which are a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more complicated, and so the choices tend to require a little bit more thought and consideration, because basically you're dealing with what it's like to be an immigrant during the 1940s and 50s. So for example, in one part of the game, you are walking down the street as Adwin, and a group of white children come running up to you, trying to touch your hair and your skin immediately. You then have the choice to either brush them away, try to yell at them, tell them to stop. You can let them do that, or you can try and explain why you don't want them to suddenly start touching you. Um, 
what are the societal consequences of that sort of choice? How do you make that sort of decision and what are the consequences come from that? How do you deal with that? Now, that may not seem like a massive choice that you have to make, but for some people, it may not be a choice that they've ever had to consider. I've had to consider that myself in the past. And being a black male, I have actually grown up knowing that, unfortunately, my words and my actions have been taken as a representation of my entire race. Um, I know I have to be very aware. Sometimes that's even intentionally taken as almost a, uh, an aggressive kind of thought, really. Um, so we're asking the player to ask, kind of think about these sort of things and decide what actually are the lines being drawn. If someone comes running up to you, asking you what the time is, not for the intention of trying to find out actually what the time is, but to find out whether you speak English and how well you speak English, what do you do in that sort of situation? So these are the sorts of experiences that require a sort of personal consideration that comes with the day-to-day -day micro transgressions and microaggressions and societal consequences that games don't often deal with. But it's becoming more relevant in the medium. Um, now this is actually a screenshot from Bury Me, My Love, um, seeing as we've uh, obviously heard Flora talking about it. And uh, it kind of deals with those sort of same kind of topics, those same sort of themes. But there are lots of other games as well that do kind of cover this sort of thing as well. Called, uh, there's another one called um, Survival, which is about young migrants and refugees. It's actually created by um, a lot of young migrants and refugees as well, which makes it quite unique in the video game sphere. And uh, there's another game called Papers, Please, which is actually one of my favorite examples of this kind of subgenre, where you play a border guard who must review the paperwork of immigrants coming into a fictional country. Um, sometimes the fictional country border guard papers uh, that he gets are horribly forged. They're obviously blatantly forged and horribly miscorrected, but you then have to try and decide whether you turn a blind eye and let them through the border, or instead you decide to cut them off. Um, both decisions have implications on your family and also your own safety, so you're constantly being asked the question as to how far you're going to make that decision before it affects you personally, but also how it's going to affect the people coming into this country. So going back to Windrush Tales again, um, I'm not going to give you a Windrush a lecture about Windrush itself, um, but one of the main themes that we really wanted to explore was we had a whole generation of immigrants that came into the country, um, kind of like were asked to help out during the war, and then after the war they were asked to quote unquote come home and help out re rebuild the entire country. And when they actually arrived, they were discriminated against, they were attacked, and they became victims of entire governmental campaigns to make them feel unwelcome. If you're not familiar with Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech, then feel free to have a look at that at some point in the future. It's, um, it's quite horrific, really, just to see an entire government just villainize an entire set of people because they felt that immigration was a threat to British society. Um, so as we write the game, we're constantly basically asking you where that line of dehumanization is um, when you're trying to integrate yourself into a new society and just trying to make ends meet, which is inherently decide to basically make it life difficult for you. Um, there's been a fair bit of fiction, TV especially, and a little bit of film, a little bit of stage plays as well, which have looked at Windrush on a whole. But the advantages of doing a video game as opposed to anything else is that it's a really powerful source of empathy. So you're being asked to make a decision what you would do when you're put in the shoes of the circumstances of these people. And if we've done a good enough job as creators, then hopefully it feels like an experience which is probably a little bit more authentic and uh, a little bit real and has consequences to every single one of your actions. So you get a very small slice of what it was like to be like during that entire period of time. Now, while we're telling stories of immigrants and putting you, the player, in the shoes of that, and it is a great form of empathy. A friend recently pointed out to me that, that there is a danger that comes from that. Um, mainly that the player can take this experience and then use it as a very shallow way of saying, 
that they then understand that entire subject matter. Like, for example, you can play Windrush Tales and some people make come away going, okay, I know exactly what it's like to be a black immigrant and use that as the basis for their arguments, especially if it's bad faith arguments. Um, or they can say that they know what it's like to feel an entire generation's worth of pain and hardship. Um, it's a bit like someone basically watching something like 12 Years a Slave and then going, hey, I know what it's like to be a slave now. Obviously, this is truthful and very dishonest. Um, this isn't something that can be fixed or solved easily. Um, there's no real easy answer for this. And my experience as a 40-year-old black male is going to be entirely different to an experience of another 40-year-old black male. I do not speak for all 40-year-old black males, so I can't dare to speak for everyone that came on the Empire Windrush. Um, at the same time, we shouldn't let that danger be too discouraging into what we create and how we approach these sorts of subject matters. In fact, it's probably a great impetus to allow us to create more because the more that we create these sorts of stories, the more voices that we give to these sorts of stories, the broader spectrum that we, we give to them at the same time. We create a wider view of what it's like to be and experience these sorts of things during these periods of time. And if we're doing that, we're creating more ways for people to think about them. And if we can help people change their minds or think about immigration, think about race, think about discrimination in different ways, then that's a massive deal in itself. That's absolutely huge. Games are an amazing tool for that because as creators, I feel that we do have responsibility to have to step outside the boundaries of what is expected of us in a medium. Um, that holds true for other entertainment forms as well. Um, just a basic example of this sort of thing that holds true across most mediums. Now, whether fantasy is being used or not, in games, you're more likely to see orcs and trolls being used as a way to express racial diversity than actual people of colour. Um, this generally kind of comes across quite often also in TV series as well, where you won't see, you'll have fantasy series and you won't see many people of colour in them. Now, the excuses for this tend to be, oh, well, there weren't many immigrants during that time. <laughs> there weren't many black people or people of colour during that time. And that has been proven wrong many, many times. Like, for example, here, and here, and even here. Which is basically to say that these are stories that can be told and should be told. Now, when these stories are told sometimes, we tend to, some people, some companies, they tend to focus on the more negative aspects of things. So going back to the slave story again, it's as a black person, a lot of the stories, a lot of the films that I used to see when I was growing up were either comedies or slave stories. And the slave stories in particular, you know, they are important. They should be told, they, people should be educated. But suffering isn't our only way of expressing these stories. These are not the only stories that we can tell, and these are not the only stories that we should be telling. Basically, Windrush Tales is a way of hopefully being able to express a diversity of story, of telling these sort of uh, tales, really. And while it is a story about leaving one country and coming to another country and then that country pushing them away, we will talk about hardship, we will talk about discrimination, we will talk about racism, because it would be horribly dishonest not to talk about those things in the game. But it's also equally important to be able to convey a sense of hope, which is the reason why we do have the subtitle, A Game of Hope, because Without that sense of hope, without that courage, without that strength that my grandparents and that our parents displayed, we wouldn't be able to play or create anything like Windrush Tales in the first place. Thank you.